His name is Joseph Goebbels, and this is his biography. Wallace, this is Biography. Our story, Joseph Goebbels. Of all the members of the Nazi hierarchy, none was closer or more trusted by Adolf Hitler than Dr. Paul Joseph Goebbels. As Minister of Propaganda, his job was to arouse a nation to prepare the German people for war. Hatred is my trade, Goebbels declared. It takes you a long way further than any other emotion. Meine Kommilitonen. Berlin, May 10th, 1933. Joseph Goebbels, Minister of Propaganda and Public Enlightenment of the Third Reich, commands the wholesale burning of books written by what he calls undesirable authors. Now the soul of the German people can express itself, he proclaims. These flames will not only illuminate the end of an old era, they will also light up the new. One book the Nazis destroy was written in 1823 by the German poet Heinrich Heine. In it appears this statement. Where they burn books, sooner or later they will also burn human beings. Born in Wright, Germany in 1897, Joseph Goebbels is a neurotic boy. He is ignored by his father, but protected and idolized by his domineering mother. Young Goebbels appears in school plays, but he is disliked by fellow students. Crippled by infantile paralysis, he hides his feeling of inferiority behind a mask of arrogance. 1914, Germany launches World War I. 17-year-old Joseph Goebbels is rejected for military service. But he tells anyone who notices his slight limp that he is a war casualty. For five years, Goebbels shuttles between eight different universities. What exactly do I study, he says? Everything and nothing. I want to become a man. I want to become a great personality. After graduation, he works in a series of minor clerical positions, none suited to his grandiose ambitions. In June 1922, at the age of 25, Goebbels attends a meeting of the newly formed Nazi party. Their philosophy is a strange jumble of nationalism, socialism, and militarism, put together by a former army corporal named Adolf Hitler. Hitler is surrounded by misfits, social outcasts and hoodlums attracted by the military trappings of the Nazi party. This man is dangerous because he believes what he says, Goebbels writes of Hitler. The secret of his strength lies in his fanatical faith in the movement. Inspired by Hitler's flamboyant oratory, Goebbels joins the Nazi party. I have found a cause, a reason for my existence, he says. And he begins his career as a propagandist, writing inflammatory pamphlets for the party. In two years, Goebbels becomes an influential and a feared figure in the Nazi ranks. November 1926, Hitler appoints Goebbels party leader in Berlin. To eliminate all those who may threaten his new power, Goebbels dismisses 400 party members on trumped-up charges of disloyalty to Hitler. Is banned from public speaking by the police when his speeches ignite a series of street brawls and riots. But in a party newspaper called Der Angriff, the Anger, he denies the responsibility for the violence, blaming instead the communists in Berlin. 
We must break through the wall of anonymity, he tells party members. The Berliners may insult us, slander us, beat us up, but they must talk about us. August 1927, the first party rally is held at Nuremberg, later to become a national shrine to Nazism. Goebbels begins to learn the techniques for staging dramatic spectacles. Hitler plays upon the crowd as if it were a delicate instrument, he writes. He turns their fears and frustrations into anger and hatred, and then adds Goebbels, they are his. Goebbels launches a campaign to elect Hitler as Reich's Chancellor. In two years, Goebbels' aggressive tactics make Hitler the best-known political personality in Germany. January 1933. Feeble and old, Reich President von Hindenburg is forced to name Adolf Hitler as Germany's Chancellor. has been born, Goebbels declares. Fourteen years of work have been crowned with victory. The German Revolution has begun. feeds his vanity and his need for power on Hitler's popularity. I revere and love him, Goebbels confides to his diary. With such a man, one can really conquer the world. untiringly to build the image of Hitler in the minds of the German people as the supreme leader, the almost mythological hero. Each public appearance, every photograph or motion picture of Hitler is carefully planned, dramatically staged, to enhance his legendary status with young and old alike. The people are the beginning, middle, and end of all our endeavors, says Goebbels. August 1934, President von Hindenburg is dead. Following a brief period of silence on the German radio, Goebbels makes the announcement that Adolf Hitler will assume the combined offices of President and Chancellor under the title of Führer and Reichschancellor of Germany. Goebbels to a disarmament conference held by the League of Nations in Geneva. He relishes his new prestige, the attention he receives at this world forum. He is aware that Hitler plans to withdraw from the League of Nations, but in his talks he cynically pledges Germany's cooperation. For years, Goebbels will gloat over his triumph at Geneva. I made fools, he will say, of them all. Returning to Germany, Goebbels boasts, our propaganda is acknowledged not only by the German, but by the international press to be model and unique. But despite his confidence, Nazi propaganda is ridiculed in various parts of the world. At the age
age of 40, Goebbels' relentless pursuit of power has made him a key figure in the Nazi regime. He vies for Hitler's favor with men like Luftwaffe Chief Goering, SS Commander Himmler, and Deputy Chancellor Hess. To gain further recognition from Hitler, Goebbels devises a savage propaganda campaign to support Hitler's determination to wipe out Germany's Jewish population. Our pure Aryan blood, Goebbels lectures, must not be tainted by the Jewish bacillus. Jewish men, women, and children are arrested. The lucky ones are deported. The others face death in Nazi concentration camps. In 12 years, four million human beings will be sacrificed to the madness Goebbels has helped spawn. In 1938, Goebbels is summoned to the Bavarian mountain retreat of Der Führer, where Hitler rests from his plans of conquest in the company of his mistress, Eva Braun. Though Goebbels is married and the father of four young daughters, he has been carrying on a love affair with a German actress. An enraged Hitler tells Goebbels that he is threatening the moral reputation of the Nazi hierarchy. He orders Goebbels to end the affair and return immediately to his wife and family. Goebbels submissively agrees never to see his mistress again. Within a month, a Nazi official reports Goebbels' period of disgrace seems to be over. of Germany's right to rule the world, Hitler unleashes his Nazi hordes on the smaller nations of Europe. Goebbels justifies each new conquest by calling the war necessary for the protection of Germany. He refers to each new blitzkrieg as a Nazi expedition, and he makes certain there are only glowing reports issued from the many battlefronts. During a war, Goebbels instructs his staff, news should be given out for instruction rather than information. Goebbels exercises rigid control over news released to foreign correspondents. Any reporter who tries to file an unauthorized story is banned from the Third Reich. Paris falls in the spring of 1940. As Hitler makes his plans for the signing of the armistice, Goebbels delightedly presents his Führer with a stunning idea. The ancient railroad car in which the Germans were forced to sign the 1918 armistice will be returned to the same location. And there, the representatives of France will humbly surrender their nation to Adolf Hitler. Goebbels is overjoyed at the success of his idea. Says a friend, he danced around the room like a drunken spider. December 11th, 1941. Adolf Hitler stands before his puppet parliament in the Berlin Reichstag to declare war on the United States. He charges that President Roosevelt, backed by American capitalists and Jews, is solely responsible for the Second World War. He thunders that the German nation will survive, even if thousands of Churchills and Roosevelts conspire against it. Joseph Goebbels sits on the platform behind his bureau, supremely satisfied by what he believes is his accomplishment. This is the godlike dictator he has created. This is the Holocaust he has ignited. Joseph Goebbels steps up the Nazi propaganda campaign. In his own domain, he is a petty tyrant. He wants no personal contact with his staff, says one of Goebbels' aides. He prefers them to be working machines without personality, which can be switched on and off as he pleases. the war as a glorious, heroic crusade in the name of the Third Reich. 
in Nuremberg, an appearance by Der Fuhrer, takes on the proportions of a visitation from the supreme deity. death becomes a necessary public spectacle. He personally produces mass funerals as a monument to Nazi courage and sacrifice. opportunity, Goebbels continues to suggest new methods of fulfilling his desire to exterminate the Jews of Germany. The Jews have deserved the catastrophe that has now overtaken them, he writes. Their destruction will go hand in hand with the destruction of our enemies. We shall thereby render an inestimable service to a humanity tormented for thousands of years by the Jews. Retribution strikes as the RAF makes its first mass raid deep inside Nazi Germany. Goebbels invents a bizarre new slogan, our own fear will give us strength. January 1943, the tide has turned. In Russia, the Nazi juggernaut has been stopped at Stalingrad. Thousands of German soldiers are dead. Hundreds of thousands have been taken prisoner. If ever we believed in victory faithfully and unshakenly, it is now in this hour, Goebbels declares. We can see it right ahead of us, and all we have to do is grasp it. As Hitler allocates more and more power to Goebbels, the man called the Little Doctor envisions himself as Hitler's personal deputy. When the Fuhrer disagrees with him, Goebbels privately puts the blame on Hitler's generals, ministers, and staff lackeys for giving the Fuhrer bad advice. As long as Hitler can give us the strength of his spirit and the power of his manliness, Goebbels writes, no evil can touch us. At Berchtesgaden, Nazi officials continue to relax and enjoy the pleasures of Hitler's hospitality. In spite of crushing defeats in both the East and West, they reassure the Fuhrer that there isn't the slightest doubt of a total Nazi victory. Hitler himself has placed his faith in a new secret weapon, the flying bomb. But in test after test, his miracle weapon fails. Finally, on June 15th, Nazi rocket scientists report to Hitler that they are ready to launch a flying bomb. Goebbels names it the V-1, Vergeltung, Vengeance. The weapon comes prematurely for this war, Goebbels tells the press. I rather believe that it will be the weapon for the next war. 1945. British and American forces cross the Rhine. The Russians have crossed Poland and are advancing on Berlin. 
military leaders like Generals Rommel and von Rundstedt are convinced the war is lost. Goebbels is approached by members of the high command who try to convince him that all authority should be taken from the mentally ailing Fuhrer. Goebbels wavers briefly, but he does not have the courage to take this final step toward ultimate power. The Third Reich is collapsing around them, but Goebbels and Hitler seem to live in a dream world. In a war-torn Germany, they attempt to recreate the triumphant spectacles they had staged in the 1930s. But their attempts at stirring the public are pitiful, even laughable. learns that many of the German civilians are preparing to surrender, he issues a final edict. If a single white flag is hoisted in a Berlin street, I shall not hesitate to have the whole street and all its inhabitants blown up. This has the full authority of the Fuhrer. April 1945. Deep beneath the rubble and flaming wreckage of Berlin, in Hitler's bunker, remnants of the Nazi hierarchy prepare to die rather than face the Russian conqueror. With gunfire crashing above them, Hitler is the first to commit suicide. And Goebbels finally declares, now I rule Germany. May 1st, 1945. Goebbels orders the death of his six children and his wife. Then, as the war he has helped ignite devastates Berlin, Goebbels shoots himself. His final orders are that his body is to be burned in the garden of the Reichschancellor. A fire is so popular, said Goebbels. It appeals to the imagination of the people. beloved Adolf Hitler and to glorifying the Third Reich. He conjured up images of German legions that would sweep heroically across the face of Europe and establish a great new order. Though his life's work was a lie, he stumbled on one truth that revealed the nature of his soul and of all tyrants. In his diary, Goebbels wrote, I have learned to despise the human being from the bottom of my heart.